uh, given the situation with the COVID-19 in the country. But to have this conversation, we are joined now by Senator Sylvia Kasanga, who is a nominated senator of the uh, uh, Wiper Party. We also have uh, Gladys Wanga, who is a member of parliament for Homer Bay County, and we're expecting to be joined by one Gladys boss from Wasin Gishu. And let's begin uh, from what we are seeing now. I want to begin with you, Senator Kasanga. Of course, uh, uh, we are told that um, the coronavirus disease is sort of uh, flattening and now we should be expecting to resume normalcy. Uh, from where you sit as the chair of the Ad Hoc Committee on Coronavirus at the Senate, uh, do you think you have reached that point to review this position? Are we seeing uh, the real situation on the ground? Good morning, Sam, and thank you again for having me. Uh, Sam, you know, we've had engagements with the Ministry of Health, and even just last week we had a presentation from the Ministry of Health on the status where we are at as a country. And it is very clear that we cannot start celebrating. We cannot say now we are flattening the curve and we should start celebrating. I think the issue we should be we should be talking about is that for the counties that were heavily affected, uh, for instance, Nairobi and the coastal region that had the shutdown, they were able to contain themselves. And what we shall see now is a surge in the counties. And uh, that is why the response team at national level has shifted the focus now to the counties, which is where we are now all engaging and looking at. So we are not off, uh, off the hook. And I think what the, the conversation that now uh, everyone is trying to have at national and county level is how can we at least begin to try and progress ourselves as a country considering the status of our economy is so affected. The education sector is heavily, mm -hmm. heavily, heavily affected amongst the others. So the question is, how do we proceed or continue with our lives considering COVID is not about to end? This is a situation we are going to have to live with now for some time. By the time there's any, any sort of vaccine that is likely to come, mm -hmm. um, we're in this situation, so we have to find a way of of, uh, of moving forward. But of course, uh, there's the stress from from the public and those who are engaging with the Ministry of uh, of, uh, of Education and all the other ministries, the national response team. That at least can our decisions be guided by facts, by figures, you know, by 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 our environment, the way the way our environment is. Mm -hmm. uh, let us not just take everything that we are getting from from say WHO. That is more of a blanket situation for global. Let us look at our own environment and make the decisions that are befitting for us as, as a country, as a nation, so that at least our livelihoods can begin to start being built up again, considering right. a lot of Kenyans are truly affected by this situation. And Honorable Wanga, do you think from the information we have been receiving so far on the health situation of the country, we're that place that we can confidently make a decision, for instance, to resume school, of course, young ones that would have to get into these institutions and get exposed, you think we are at that point? I think it is uh, time to begin having the conversation. And uh, I want to agree with Professor Magoha that, you know, uh, we must begin having the conversation because increasingly, uh, you know, people are just getting back to normal with, uh, you know, with their daily business. People are, are going to work. You know, when you see traffic in town, for example, uh, you know, things are, are going back and people are taking caution. Everyone, you know, uh, mostly are wearing their masks, you know, around town here and so on. So I think, yes, it is time to begin having the conversation. I would support a situation where we, we could ha have a, you know, staggered approach mm -hmm. where perhaps we can have the candidates <clears throat> beginning. They are older. The chil those children are older. They are more able to take in instructions and take care of themselves. Then we can have the other younger ones because the younger ones are unable, if you tell your class three, class two, class one, child mm -hmm. to wear a mask throughout the day, there is no guarantee. Mm -hmm. But if you have a class eight or a form four or a form three, then you you are sure that they can follow some of these instructions. So I think we we definitely must begin having that conversation. Because right. by the even even as you, you look at the political terrain and so on, pe people are increasingly asking themselves, is it, uh, is it right now to keep our children in their houses while you know, politicians go out there while, you know, these other things happen. So let's have the conversation. And I'm looking forward to hearing what the education stakeholders will come up with. Let them not be afraid, you know, let them be bold and come out and tell Kenyans, this is what we are thinking and this is how we feel we should move forward. So we defer that to them, mm -hmm. but I definitely think it's time to have the conversation of even partial opening up of, of our schools, okay. definitely our, our universities. 
Of course, uh, the Cabinet Secretary indicated that on the 25th of September, that's when they'll be making that pronouncement on uh, the way forward. So we'll be expecting for that. But like I said, there'll be a meeting this morning of stakeholders and that committee that was th is established by the Cabinet Secretary to look into the COVID-19 impact on education. And now to, uh, to bring in uh, Gladys Boz from Was in Gishu. Uh, let's talk about uh, the situation that we're seeing in the country of uh, governors uh, being arraigned on uh, charges of corruption. Uh, the latest one being one Ali Korane, the governor of Garis, of course, uh, looking at the images of yesterday. He would appear, he was uh, at the courts since 2 o'clock, but even uh, till late in the afternoon, he was not arraigned and uh, he was not um, allowed to take plea. But also, uh, there are several people from, I believe, from his uh, constituents that uh, came to block access, even for the media, not to, to get a glimpse of uh, him in the, inside that Land Rover. And I want to ask you this question. We are seeing so many governors now. Uh, from my count, we have uh, six, actually seven, facing corruption charges. Five of them have already been barred from access, accessing offices. I mean, do you think this is um, the right way to fight uh, corruption at a time that we see them being released on bail and then prosecution taking a bit of time to uh, come back to the court. Of course, the magistrate's also giving a mention date in the future uh, weeks. Uh, good morning, Sam. Um, I'm happy to be at your show. I, I think, yes, I've seen there is uh, many, uh, having seen that they, the way the court, they remember the court system, he also has a challenge because uh, they are trying to do virtual court. Their exchange of documents is extremely challenging uh, because the registries are not open. And so some of the fact that uh, somebody is brought to court early in the morning and may not uh, be before the court until uh, later in the afternoon has to do with those challenges. So just the way you've said that the schools should review and have a conversation Mm -hmm. on how they should, can reopen schools, I think the National, uh, the National Council for, uh, the National Council for J uh, J Justice has to actually begin to also have that conversation. Because remember, you've got to link the prosecutor, you've got to link the investigating officer, you've got to link the magistrate, and then you've got to link with the accused person who may probably be in the police cells, which doesn't even have facilities on how to be able to appear before the court uh, and take plea. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so you look at those challenges. But there's also something else uh, that is important. Uh, the prosecutors, by the time they have someone uh, arrested and uh, brought before to court to take plea, I think it's improper and inefficient and not good practice to then say, oh, uh, we do not have uh, all the witnesses, we haven't finished the investigations, and so on. Mm -hmm. It is assumed, and it is standard best international practice, that by the time you bring an accused person to take plea and that you have charged them, then you should have completed investigations. Mm -hmm. Because on that same very day when a person takes plea, you're supposed to avail to them all the witness statements and all the evidence that is available against them. That is, the, that is what the law says. But you see in this case, uh, the prosecution is allowed to get away with trampling on people's fundamental rights. Because you've got to balance the need to fight corruption or the need to, to, um, to prosecute crimes and the, the fundamental rights mm -hmm. of the accused person. So that is important. People are forgetting that balance. They assume that the moment you're accused, you have no right to, you have no rights anymore. That is not the case. Right. Your fundamental rights must remain at all times. Okay. O o all right. Of course, um, the accused persons still have the right. But I, uh, Senator Kasanga, you see that the Senate that uh, really oversights um, the counties. But since we started having these governors barred from accessing offices, the first one was the uh, Samburu governor, Moses Leonard Kulal, then um, uh, Fernan Waititu followed, and later Mike Sonko in December last year. So now we have uh, Mothomi Njuki joining the list, but also uh, Kothobado, and probably uh, one Ali Korana might follow suit. So have you seen any change in as far as the execution of um, as, uh, or delivery of services in the counties, uh, having been affected by governors having to, uh, to be blocked from accessing the offices? 
some, you know, ideally, even if the governor is not uh, physically in the office, he should not buy any any of the functions of the offices to continue. I think the systems are set up such that everything should be able to continue. Nothing should stop um, the counties or bring them to a standstill because the governor has been taken, uh, you know, to court or anything like that. But um, in as much as um, Honorable uh, Cholet is saying that, yes, the, 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 the courts have the challenge, so then the wheels of justice seem to turn, you know, a bit slowly. I believe when it comes to handling of public money, it is in order. It is in order that a governor or any public officer who mm -hmm. is just found or, or, or is suspected to be and has, has been brought to court, it's important that they step aside. They step aside up until the time which they have cleared their names and only then can they be brought back to handle public money. And this issue, we have to really take it seriously. Our constitution is very clear in, in Chapter 6 on the issues of integrity. In this country, you know, we are dealing with a lot of these corruption issues. It's a thing that is, 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 is really angering Kenyans uh, completely. And it is a thing that has brought ourselves to our knees. It is the reason probably why we are in such a debt situation as a country. Mm -hmm. Let us be sincere about this conversation. When it comes to handling of public money, I think... If anything, if it were possible to even lower the bar a little bit when it comes to the wheels of justice, such that even just a small mention that you have probably, you know, mishandled public money, a loan should be taken with a lot of seriousness. And that person should st step aside until their name is 100% cleared. We have to take this issue extremely seriously, Sam. I think that is where, where we come from, even as a party when we are launching our, our digital recruitment mm -hmm. drive yesterday. Mm -hmm. The thing that we see, we are going to present ourselves as candidates who are, are not tainted with corruption, as most of our, our members are. And we are saying we have to have zero tolerance to corruption, zero tolerance to mishandling of public money, because this is the thing that has brought this country to where it is today. Right, and Honorable Wanga, looking at the situation in Nairobi, of course, uh, since Governor Mike Sonko was barred from accessing his office in December 2019, a lot, of, a lot has changed, including the establishment of the Nairobi Metropolitan Service that would appear to have taken just four functions, but very critical, in, even in, it, in as far as the budget is concerned. But we are seeing the situation in Migori, where your party has called for the impeachment of that governor. Do you think we need to change strategy so that even if you're barred from office, then something else needs to happen to ensure the free or smooth flow of uh, service delivery um, yes um, I think uh, first I really want to uh, support the drive by the you know DCI and DPP in fighting corruption in the counties and unless we we really do this and we have been saying even as much as we are fighting corruption at the national level if we don't fight corruption in the counties and and the counties are vulnerable and the reason they are vulnerable is the systems that the national government has spent time forming in the last 55 years or so um, have only begun in the in the in the county government. So therefore, there's a, there's a lot of systemic weaknesses mm -hmm. um, within the county governments, and that the Senate actually should be, you know, developing a lot of legislation to be able to guide operations within the county, so that by the time we are 10 years of devolution, at the end of this term, we have some sort of systems. The weaknesses in the counties, uh, the systems of the counties, makes it very easy. Um, for looting to go on at that level and therefore i support the focus on fighting corruption in the in the counties when it comes to nairobi i think the situation is different because uh, the governor of nairobi uh, himself surrendered you know he said that look i'm unable to to run the city and, and nairobi you know 60 percent of our gdp really is generated here in nairobi and therefore it is a critical place it is the capital city and when the governor surrendered his uh, his functions to the nms which i must say are actually have taken over and are doing a very uh, a good job then it is different from a situation such as migori where the governor has just been you know told to step aside from the office and and when you know coming to to to, to migori you know the governor has been charged, has been asked to uh, step aside and the party and has made a decision to uh, make sure, you know, if you look at the counties that are operating smoothly, mm -hmm. like Kiambu, the governor was completely taken out of the way, you know, and a new governor sworn in, and therefore 
the, the, the functions of the county are operating. But where you have the governor just hanging somewhere, lacking somewhere over his officials, I do not think that the functions are going on uh, smoothly. And I think uh, ODM in Migori wants to take the approach um, of Kiambu, where the governor, you know, having been charged and so on, now steps out of, uh, now is impeached, is completely mm -hmm. out of the way. The deputy governor, you know, takes over so that they have full executive authority to run mm -hmm. the county if you're just out of the office and you don't have and your deputy does not have authority or anything i i must say there you know even even though senator kasanga said the functions should be able to operate smoothly they don't operate smoothly because there is executive authority but mm -hmm. that executive authority is sitting at home somewhere trying to remote control everything trying to deal with witnesses you know anybody who could be a witness in their case within the county you know trying to deal with those with that going on you cannot have smooth operations within the the and, county and honorable boss you're the advocate here and you've been advocating for um, the interest of the accused so how do you balance their interest but also the public interest at a time that uh, for instance uh, gladys wanga there is referring to the smooth operations within kiambu and nairobi county uh, not not the same can be said in other counties where the governors have been asked to step aside how do you maneuver this without really um uh, going against the the interest of devolution um, I think what uh, my colleague uh, Gladys Wanga and uh, Sylvia Kasanga are saying is that uh, there is actually need for law reform. As I listen to them, it's clear that there is need for some law reform. Uh, the Senate should be looking at the regulations and seeing what needs to be passed in order to deal with this kind of new menace. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the public service, once you are charged, you then go on half salary and you're interdicted and you remain at home until such time as the case is cleared. Should you be cleared, you will come back to work and you will be pay, given the back pay of your, of your salary. The same thing with the judges. Uh, once uh, the Judicial Service Commission uh, requests a tribunal, then again you're put on half pay mm -hmm. Uh, you stay suspended from duty until such time as the tribunal clears you or determines your matter. Mm -hmm. In the case of governors, there isn't a clear-cut case of what should happen. Right. So we need, it's a very quick matter, and I would appeal to the Senate, because they will, answer, will be able to move this kind of legislation and immediately make a clear system of what happens when a governor is uh, charged, mm -hmm. what happens to the functions uh, or, or who executes um, executive authority in the absence of a deputy governor, because before it was assumed that the deputy governor would take, even if the governor was unwell or unable to perform his duties, mm -hmm. then the deputy governor would do it. But uh, in this case, uh, it's not clear cut. So this is what we call a law reform moment. When people talk about a constitutional moment, this is a law reform moment. And when you talk about preparation of, um, of a graft case, when, as I said, the prosecution cannot say that uh, we have charged the person, but we still need to undertake on, uh, investigations. Remember, again, that shows that's a failure of the system mm -hmm. because we have, um, we have the internal audit uh, system in government who are you know, stationed in the particular office. Right. That means there's an internal audit department under the audit, the internal auditor general. You know, people always think there is only uh, an auditor general. There is an internal auditor general right. who, see, who actually is at the national government, but has officers deployed to various departments, whether in the judiciary, whether in the ministries, and also in the counties. Mm -hmm. And those reports are supposed to be continuous. They must never stop. For every amount that moves, there, is an, there has to be an internal audit report. For every payment that is made, right. part of the procurement cycle, the internal auditor has to append their signature. The, and then the external audit, what we call the external audit, which is by the Auditor General's office, those are from time to time or upon request. So therefore, right. the, the, immediately the prosecution wants to prosecute anyone, they, must, they immediately have the internal audit report and then may have a special audit requested immediately, or they should have the continuous audit report. The challenge we have is the Auditor General's office has always fallen way behind, and mm -hmm. has only, uh, maybe sometimes they were two years behind. The last time I checked, I'm not too sure 
uh, what their time schedule is now, as I'm not in the public service. Right. But if they can be uh, assisted or that particular, and those are part of the requests we should be getting from the Attorney General's office, that they, they, we improve the facilities and the personnel in his office or her office so that she's able uh, to, to have her... Uh, audit reports up to date. Okay. So by the time uh, the graft officials zero in on a particular uh, official, they have their own system of auditing. Before they send in the official, they also have their own system of auditing. But they should also coordinate with the auditor general's office to ensure that they fast track the audit on that, and it shouldn't be too it shouldn't be too slow. Okay. After all, we've only had uh, we've only had devolution for eight years. So those are the challenges uh, that we. We need to have. But okay. at the same time, Honorable I want to Boss, uh, allow me to cut it short. Uh, allow me to cut it short because uh, it's uh, past uh, 7 o'clock. We need to take a short break. But when we return, we'll be speaking about um, uh, the state of the counties at a time that we know that um, they are currently uh, facing a cash crunch. We know that uh, the governors had threatened to shut down by, the th by Thursday this week. Um, the information we have is that the National Treasury is yet to release money to the counties. So will the governors go ahead with their threats to shut down the counties? We have that conversation after the break. Welcome back. You're still watching Daybreak, and this is the time that I want us to focus on the state of the counties. At the time that uh, we know the governor said that they are going to shut down government come Thursday, and I'm um, still with the uh, Honorable Gladys Wanga from Homa Bay, Gladys Boss from Wasin Gishu, and Senator Sylvia Kasanga, a nominated senator. And I want to begin with you, Gladys Wanga, because you hold a serious position at the National Assembly as chair of the Finance Committee. And uh, is it sometime last week we had um, communication to the Senate as well as the National Assembly on the fate of counties? Do we know? What whether now the National Treasury has been cleared to release the funds to counties? Um, uh, thank you, Sam. Sam, I wanted to first uh, speak to the issue of the Auditor General that, that was raised by uh, Honorable Boss, because mm -hmm. the Auditor General comes under the Finance Committee uh, of the National Assembly. And I wanted to say that the Auditor General has actually raised uh, requests uh, for increased funding mm -hmm. so that they can have the capacity to properly and quickly audit 
um, counties, uh, you know, and other you know, government uh, institutions that get government money. And, and the other request that the Auditor General has made is amendments to the law, because right now you find that, uh, you know, auditees or the institutions being audited are required to give in their reports three months after the end of the financial year. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, they would like reduced to one month after the end of the financial year, just so that they can catch up um, with audit. Because every institution brings in their, their documents at the end of the third month. So everyone is coming on 30th of September, everybody. You, you know, uh, so so if this is reduced to the 30th of uh, of, uh, of July, right. then now Auditor General will have enough time to also uh, carry out some of these audits. But what we need is cap a, an, a capacitated office of the Auditor uh, General with sufficient staff, right. you know, with sufficient money so that they can go, if you ask for a special audit, they can quickly uh, do it and give the report to the uh, committee of the Senate mm -hmm. or the National assembly, whichever may apply. So some of those are things we are dealing with and should be able to um, deal with as, as the year progresses. Um, coming back to the issue of the revenue, there is a proposal to amend, make amendments to the PFM Act so that, um, and although we have done this in the past, as I mm -hmm. mentioned uh, last week, Sam, that in the event uh, that uh, counties are unable to, uh, we are unable to agree, especially on the uh, county allocation of revenue, mm -hmm. then uh, counties should be able to be given up to 50% mm -hmm. of their money on vote on account. Uh, but there have been proposals to amend the PFM Act to make this uh, possible, and that is what we will be reviewing. I think after the Senate uh, uh, debates the the revenue uh, formula, maybe I think it's today, right. after they debate, and if, if there is uh, still a stalemate, then we must look seriously at uh, making those amendments to the PFM so that the, the counties can operate on votes on account, mm -hmm. so that up to 50 percent of the, um, their amounts can be given to them. They can begin, uh, you know, spending, especially on their, on their uh, you know, sort of like running uh, costs, recurrent expenditure, right. so that they, they right. not grind uh, to a halt. So I'd like to, you know, just urge the national treasury to move with speed on on, on that vote on account matter so that counties do not uh, grind to a halt because counties have become a big center of development many households many families many young people mm -hmm. derive their their livelihoods from there not just that not just the people who work but the businesses that operate around the county environment and i think right. that is not what right. should be grinding to a halt, especially right now when the economy has taken a hit uh, following the COVID-19. Oh, okay. Uh, oh. Senator Kasanga, I'll get to you. But before I do so, Honorable um, Ebos, so now Wanga says that um, uh, there should be that possibility of uh, vote on account. I look at the PFM Act, there's no provision of that, but in the PFM um, regulations, it would appear that uh, Regulation 134 uh, gives uh, that room of uh, having some 50% of the resources released to the counties. Uh, what happens when you have a regulation providing a certain situation but is not contained in the principal act and the constitution does not really uh, expressly provide for uh, the release of money on vote on account at such a situation that we have the CARA not yet uh, enacted by Senate? Yeah, I, I think uh, the details of cash on account doesn't necessarily have to be in the main act. It can be a, uh, it can be a, 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 a regulation published by uh, the, the cabinet secretary for the national treasury. And I think it's something that they can look into because within the various regulations and the main PFM Act, they can be able uh, to link to uh, the main statute and come up with uh, regulations. I remember regulations are actually gazetted by the cabinet secretary and take effect immediately even as they are being considered by the Committee on Delegated Legislation mm -hmm. uh, in, in Parliament. And they stay in effect until such time as the committee approves or, um, or rejects the, the, the regulations. So I think the, the, the Cabinet Secretary for the National Treasury must sit and quickly uh, be innovative because the thing about the law is flexible. And the reason why... Uh, the lawmakers delegated legislation to the executive was because they knew situations like this would arise mm -hmm. where you can't start moving the actual change of the act of parliament mm -hmm. but that 
the executive can still be able to move in the interim. So there is a window there for the cabinet secretary of the right. national treasury, and he must take it up. S Senator Kasanga, do you think the county governors have been ignored? Because we're in the third month of the financial year, so in uh, about 15 days we'll be done with the first quarter, yet they have not received any single uh, cent for this financial year. And the cabinet secretary still says that he does not have that window. Uh, he says that he, his hands are tied. What do you think needs to happen? Uh, thank you, Sam. <clears throat> um, I think uh, from, from my colleagues, Today, you can hear that, sincerely speaking, the cabinet secretary's hands are not really tied. I think it's a question of goodwill because they could have picked up on this uh, little window here that has been mentioned here by Honorable uh, uh, Wanga, and they could have affected it honestly and sincerely. So let's 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 not, uh, you know, the focus seems to be saying that because Senate has not yet approved this formula or, or, or the formula, that is the reason why then the money cannot be sent. And yet the law does have these and the regulations are there. It can be done, and there's no reason why it, it, uh, it should not be done. And you know, um, Sam, this issue is really weighing on the shoulders of, of senators uh, greatly, because once every five years, Senate has the sole mandate of, of approving or you know debating and providing Kenyans with a formula for allocation of revenue. It is a very big deal. It is one of the core mandates of the, the Senate under our new constitution. So it's a situation that is taken very seriously, and as you have seen, senators have, you know, put even their lives on the line for this uh, and for what they believe in. So that at least we can see a formula that we are all proud of as a Senate, because it is only once in our life, these five years, that we can say we have done this thing uh, right. And that is why you can see the debate is still ongoing. And we hope, hopefully today we shall see an end to it. But even if it doesn't come to an end, there is no reason why Senate should not be given enough time mm -hmm. to come up with a formula that we can say as a country we are proud of, as a Senate we are proud of, and we have canvassed all, all the needs of Kenyans across board, you know, from the north to the south, east, and west. And that is the whole purpose, and that is the reason why we are still, you know, having this conversation going. So as far as I'm concerned, right. the goodwill of, of, of uh, the Ministry of, um, of Treasury has to be seen in this case. And governors, you know, for a long time, governors are mm. like a purpose with senators, I guess because, you know, senators are oversighting governors, but in a sense, we are on the same page. We are, we, are, so we are the reason why the evolution must work, both governors and senators, and therefore we should be working towards the same goals and the same purposes. So at times we are cross-purpose, which I think is unfortunate. It need not be, okay. but uh, in this situation, uh, I think the, the, the ball stops with the CS for Treasury. Do you think you'll reach a solution this afternoon? Because I've looked at the order paper and uh, the, uh, the formula is back, of course, uh, with the amendments that were proposed by uh, one Senator Linturi. Do you think that today you'll have uh, uh, the final solution? I really do hope so. You see, when we handed over the committee, the 12-man com the committee to come up with it, we have left with them so that they are supposed to report back to the House. So today, uh, just even before we get into the order paper, we expect a communication from, from the speaker as to how far this conversation has gone. And truly, our hope is that if there's no consensus, mm -hmm. then we are a democracy. Let us put everything now to vote. Uh, if consensus has failed, let's put everything to a vote. That would be the right way to go. It is my sincere hope today. I can't tell you right now until, you know, we put our ears on the ground and hear the communication from the speaker, and then we shall see how the order of the day will go. All right, let's now in passing take a look at uh, some uh, events that transpired yesterday at the Senate, and uh, that involves uh, Senator Clefus Malala of Kakamega County and uh, Senator Dr. Christopher Langat of uh, Bomet County. Just watch. This time and again that my life is in danger. I've written enough letters. I've called offices in this republic. They have not taken any action, even to give me extra security. I've gone to the Kakamega County Commissioner begging for security, Mr. Chair. Nobody is willing to give me security, Mr. Chair. It is sad for me to walk around the streets of Kakamega and Kenya knowing that I'm going to die the following day, Mr. Chair. And the most painful thing, Mr. Chair, I see respectable leaders of this republic saying that I forged my arrest, Mr. Mr. Chair. After all this, somebody says that I planned with the police to forge? That I take manage my arrest? Surely. That I even sent the police a PIN number. 
Mr. Chair, I carry a heavy heart with me. Well, that was uh, Senator Kilofas Malala. Of course, uh, later on, uh, George Kinoti, the DCI boss, indicated that um, uh, whatever he was alleging was uh, fictitious. But also, there's another senator who really got emotional while addressing uh, his fellow senators. Let's watch. But our enemies, we respect that you, but you are killing us. I'm going to be operated again. <coughs> Go to Medil and you'll see the records. I can't walk now properly. They took me here to Bomet. After arriving in Bomet, I was taken to CD police station. And they told me, you have got no crime as such. All right, of course, there's another part that uh, he was really getting emotional. I want, I want to begin with you, uh, Sylvia Kasanga, because you're the senator here. These concerns, of course, there are people that have been interpreting these as um, fictitious. What, what's your gut feeling? Uh, first, I, I have to condemn the way the senators were handled, for whatever reason. You see, now, I, I might not even have the facts and the figures as to the reasons behind it. Eh? And there's no reason why we shouldn't believe our senators when they come out in public the way they did, to put their claims out for Kenyans to hear. But the way they were handled is honestly very, very disturbing. These are public officers. These are senators in their own accord elected by Kenyans. Surely, even if there was a situation or an issue that required their arrest, was that the way to do it? Was it, was it correct to go to their homes and hound them out like that? You would imagine that we have enough police stations even around parliament where a senator can be told to report himself there or, or find another way of, of, getting, uh, of, of going to get them to come out rather than going to their homes, putting them in, you know, bundling them in vehicles and driving them at ridiculous speeds uh, across counties, some even at night. I mean, this, this whole issue is, is extremely sad, and the way it was handled is, is something we have to condemn. It, it's wrong. It's wrong that the police should handle themselves in this manner because there are other ways it could have been done. As to whether these, uh, whether the senators, what they're saying is true or not true, I have no reason not to believe what they're saying. I mean, you're on public record. Would that be really a lie for somebody to come out of that distinguished nature, mm -hmm. you know, to put his, his, his cause out in public like that. And you know, even as senators, we had to demand that sitting. Some we had to demand that sitting because the first time when uh, when the DCI, when the when the IG and the, and the IG were called for this particular meeting mm -hmm. and they didn't show up first round and we had to demand and they showed up in the second round in a closed door meeting and we said, no, let this thing be done in public. Mm -hmm. Let it be done in public. Let also Kenyans know. Let Kenyans know what their, their leaders have been subjected to. And the reasons also which were not clear why these, senate, these three senators were, were you know, detained uh, on the day that we were supposed to take a vote. So, so Sam, that, that is what I can say to you. It is with okay. a lot of frustration. And, you know, leaders have to be left to do their duty as leaders, the, the, the duty they were elected to do. Let it happen. Let there not be any other issue coming in between our, our, our work. Honorable Wanga, of course, this is not the first time that you are seeing an elected leader having their security detail withdrawn. Of course, uh, last week we heard from Governor Kothobado saying that uh, three of his security officials have been withdrawn. Uh, why does this happen? And have we reached that position that now we can finally say that everybody has their freedom of association and, and uh, opinion and not really have to punish them for the positions they take by withdrawing such kind of important um, um, security uh, for themselves? Uh, well, Sam, um, I'm, you know, sympathetic to the senator's situation, and, and I think uh, any allegations they are making of, uh, of, you know, their lives being in danger and so on should be investigated. This is not the first time, you know, that uh, security is being withdrawn, not even just uh, this, this term of parliament, even the last term of parliament, we had many times our own security um, was withdrawn and, and and so on and for whatever for whatever for whatever reasons but some the point i must make is he who comes to equity well, let me say he or she who comes to equity must come with clean hands mm -hmm. there's been a lot of allegations some of of uh, you know bribery a lot of things happening in that senate um, during this process of revenue uh, sharing uh, so a, a lot you know the senators must come to equity with clean hands they must also, you know, I hear, you know, it was a bit, you know, over dramatic. 
I hear them saying, oh, you know, we, we did not do this or the other, but mm -hmm. they must come with clean hands. A lot of allegations have been made of, you know, people voting because they have been given this or the other or whatever view. And I'm not saying that those allegations are true, but the Senate must clean itself of that, those allegations, because those allegations are everywhere. Everywhere you turn, there are those allegations on the on the table. And, and, and this is why, you know, there were even, uh, it was even said that some of the senators were actually saying, right. here is my pin, come and arrest me, you know, because now I do not know what to do uh, anymore because uh, these people had given me something, these ones now, you you know, come, just come and take me because I, know, I, I no longer know what to do. And, 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 and some of these things, you know, are from very credible uh, sources, you know, including with, 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 with evidence, you know, of, of people sending their pins. So mm -hmm. he who comes to equity must come with clean hands. These matters must be investigated right. um, to the right. very end. We don't want anybody feeling insecure in this country. But at the same time, people must be honest with with, with themselves. When we hold you, high you, offices, you, when you, we hold you, high you appear offices... To doubt, you appear to doubt what uh, especially Senator Malala is saying and also how he has conducted himself. Do you have any evidence to... A substantiate that doubt? No, I've just said that I have no evidence of those uh, allegations. These are just my opinions on how I view, I view, I view some of these issues. Because surely, Sam, many of us have been arrested. We have been, you know, our security has been taken. Surely, even us, uh, you know, they say even you know women cry more easily. But you have not even seen us uh, weeping in the manner that I saw in the Senate. There could be some drama in it. Wow, uh, honourable uh, boss. Is this drama or is it real concerns and fear for uh, life? Um, yeah, that was a bit funny there, what my colleague Gladys said. But uh, I think what we are looking at and the discussions that are being held, if you look at it at a larger perspective, what we're actually talking about is excessive force, by, of use of force by the police. We are talking about police brutality. We are talking about the fact that the police are not following the law in the manner that they arrest people. So I don't know who's right or wrong, but even when you tell me that somebody feigned their arrest, then it means the police colluded with them to go and arrest them. So then that isn't even good, because then mm -hmm. that means there's something wrong with our police force. This conversation is coming at a time when uh, with the worldwide, you know, there is I can't breathe uh, protests. Mm -hmm. And all of it is about the way police handle people. When I listen to Dr. Lagat, he says he was bundled to the police station and uh, eventually was told, we don't know what you're being charged for. And that's why I'm appealing that if we just followed the law, it's very simple. The law is clear and this law is as far as when it started in the U.S. under Chief Justice Warren on the Miranda rights, which we have domesticated in our constitution, which just says when a person is arrested, the police will touch you and say, uh, you're under arrest. Anything you say will be can be used against you. You have a right to remain silent. They tell you the consequences of remaining silent. And they tell you the reasons for your arrest. Mm -hmm. Therefore, even before they move you from your house, mm -hmm. before they put you in that motor vehicle, before they did that to Dr. Lagat, they should have told him the reason for his arrest. And when they tell you you have a right to cancel, they can wait for your lawyers to arrive at the scene before they go with you. And, and I have uh, on many times said this, if we just follow the law, then there will be no debates about whether the arrest was feigned or not feigned. Because by the time the police leave the station, there will be a log as to what, where they are going to pick whom and for what reasons that person is being arrested because all the police officers Right. who are going to pick the person will have documented it. And therefore, I think, again, I always say, when something goes wrong, it's an opportunity for us to reflect and ask ourselves, do we need, because the law is pragmatic, it keeps changing. So we ask ourselves, is it a chance for us to amend our laws or is it a chance for us to tell us that we must follow the law? And therefore, when I hear uh, Dr. Lagarde said I was not told what kind of crime had been com had committed right. or or uh, Malala saying that I was picked in the middle of the night, this is a moment for the Independent Police Oversight Authority to be able to have a conversation with the police and ask, is there a necessity uh, 
to pick people at night. What's the person planning to flee the country or not? So it's those are the conversations we're having. It's about the way the operating okay. procedures of the police. I'm not saying that I, I do not know the facts of what happened to what the senators are saying, but what I can see clearly is that if we just followed the steps and the entire public knew exactly what the steps are, then we wouldn't have a challenge. We had a situation in Aidnapko uh, uh, sub-county where when a police officer was arresting a disabled woman who had uh, was apparently accused of uh, allegedly uh, brewing Chang'a, the police officer picked the pot of Chang'a and poured it over her head. Mm -hmm. And there's a picture of it. The, the thing we should be asking ourselves, are the police allowed to pour the Chang'a on your head? That's excessive force. That okay. is police brutality. The police should have just told her you're under arrest because you are brewing illegal uh, drinks. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a crime under this penal code, and we are taking you to the police station. Do you oh, want okay. a legal counsel or someone with you? And then taken her to the police. When the police hit people with rungus, that's another conversation I need to ask. When I watch them uh, clobber the woman uh, member of the county assembly of Nairobi, Mutheu, I ask myself, are the police allowed to use rungus? Really? It's so primitive. I don't know where that comes from. The police okay. can easily... Uh -huh. uh, ma wrestle you down and handcuff you. Should they hit you with a rungu? Really? And it's almost like standard procedure they're allowed to carry rungus. In other countries, the police just have a taser. Yeah, so let's move from the dark ages okay. and the stone age of carrying rungus and let's say a police force, we need to put resources, l arm them with a taser if they require one or uh, uh, what are they called, those guns that are not, that were not real bullets. Mm -hmm. uh, just so that there is less, in case they have to use force, they don't harm, they don't take any life. Uh, we need the police to be wearing uh, uh, cameras, body cameras. That oh, is something okay. that is so urgent in Kenya. Just Honorable so that boss. we can watch the police when they are undertaking the arrest. I, I, I hear you loud and clear, Honorable Boss. Let's make progress and uh, focus on our final topic here, and that is to do with uh, what you're witnessing in the country, the political campaigns that have uh, come back. I want us to start by listening to uh, what the Deputy President William Ruto said yesterday in as far as uh, the political situation in the country is concerned. Listen. We are finding all manner of cards flying. At one point, we are being told we need another layer of government, another layer of bureaucracy. At another moment, some other people are telling us that it is about extension of terms. The question you ask, my boss, President Uhuru Kenyatta, is a Democrat. I don't think President Uhuru Kenyatta has told anybody that he wants his term extended. So where are these people finding all this? I would dare ask, Oliskia Wapi? Ati Rais Uhuru Kenyatta anataka tami yake isongeshwe. Wewe ambaye unatupatia hiyo story. Oliskia Wapi? Indeed, Oliskia Wapi. That's what he's asking, but I would also ask Oliskia Wapi. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but at the same, um, Senator Kasanga, Honorable Wanga, and Honorable Bo. So we are looking at a situation, of course, over the weekend you saw a lot of uh, political rallies heated, uh, I dare add. Um, these political leaders moving around, and now we are officially in the political campaigns for 2022. Never mind that we are 693 days to the election. Senator Kasanga, I saw your party now, you're repositioning yourselves. Uh, to um, uh, recruit more members going digital. How have we just reached that, uh, th th that avenue of now starting to campaign, yet you have so much work to do? Uh, uh, Sam, it's not campaigning. I think uh, preparing ourselves and getting ourselves ready is not uh, the same as what we are seeing other leaders doing, going out into the crowds. And by the way, I have to condemn that because it's as if we're assuming COVID has disappeared, that it is okay now to go and call out the crowds and talk to them. I think these leaders need to be careful. They have a duty of care. You cannot go around now and float the, the COVID regulations as they are. And in fact, we are still wondering where is the national response team when it comes to floating all of COVID regulations. And yet, even as a committee, we dealt a lot with that high-handedness of, of police when Kenyans, when, when Wanainchi were floating COVID rules, they were really um, uh, dealt with uh, by, by the, the police force. And it's a situation which we dealt with even at committee so we are wondering why is it okay now suddenly we can see leaders going around 
and uh, having crowds come, I mean, calling out crowds to address them, and it is wrong. It is wrong. We have to observe COVID rules for now, mm -hmm. as they have been placed for us, and we want to see some action actually taken, because COVID now has moved to the counties, and we are now watching out for counties, and if we are going to have leaders going around calling out crowds like this, what's to say we won't have another surge of, of, of COVID and, you know, our country is already so strained as it is in terms of, of resources. But just to answer you, WIPA is, is right now just putting its house in order, in preparation for. We are not campaigning. We are just telling Kenyans to register. And that's why we've gone digital. Digital because it can be done from the comfort of your home on your phone. You don't, we don't have to call crowds to tell you come and register. No, we are an organized party. We are moving forward. We have presented ourselves. We've given you our motto, mm -hmm. which is Kazi Bila Wizi, because we are keen on uh, zero tolerance towards um, towards corruption, which we have seen. And, um, you know, you, these things, you, we have to do this. We are politicians. This is our work. We have to position ourselves. We have to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. And we have to prepare ourselves accordingly. That is, that is, there's nothing wrong with that. Problem is the how we are doing it. Uh, floating of COVID rules, which should be, we should be actually discussed and should be taken very seriously. Leaders should not be floating COVID rules at this point in time. But more importantly, is the Kazi part of it. Let us not forget we have a duty towards Kenyans to give, you know, to give service to Kenyans. So we are alive to that fact, and that is why even as we prepare ourselves, mm -hmm. we are not stopping to work to go and campaign. No, 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 no. That is not the that is not the case. We are working. And we, we shall continue serving Kenyans up until the time is up, and then we shall go into into politics. So all, all right. some for now, that is what I can say. All right, Senator Kasanga, you speak on behalf of the WEPA party that you represent, but uh, that would appear to be different from the other parties. Let's listen to what uh, Raylo Dinga and William Ruto had to say over the weekend. Of course, they were at different locations. Do you have that? Mombasa is under lock, and Watakuja. Wata tembea, wata mwaga pesa, wata tutusi. Fisi ya nimejivisha nguo ya, nguo ya kondo. Amejivisha nguo ya kondo. Ata mebalilisha ili mlio yake. Asemi nyangau. Nyangau. Anasema. Lakini bado ni fisi. Sawa sawa. Sawa sawa. Ukiwashe kwa zizi yako. Kondo yako yote itaenda. Ati hawa watu wananidarau watu mimi hasla ziwezi kuongoza inchi. Uh, uh, eh, safari hii tutawaonyesha ya kwamba mtoto wa, bod, mtoto wa mama wa boda boda. Ama mtoto wa mama maskini. Ama mtoto wa yule anauza kiosk. Anaweza kuongoza taifa la Kenya. Honorable Boss, Honorable Wanga, Senator Kasanga, we need to take a short break, but in return we engage on that and especially what the two leaders are saying in as far as uh, politics are concerned. ni kama yule ambaye anataka kuchinja kuku anachukua mahindi anaitana kut 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 anarusha mahindi kuku nakula mahindi na we are finding all manner of cards flying at one point we are being told we need another layer of government another layer of bureaucracy at another moment some other people are telling us that it is about extension of terms. The question you ask, my boss, President Uhuru Kenyatta, is a Democrat. 
I don't think President Uhuru Kenyatta has told anybody that he wants his term extended. So where are these people finding all this? I would dare ask, Oliskia Wapi? Welcome back. Oh, you're still watching Daybreak, and uh, we are now 22 minutes to the top of the hour, but we need to conclude on this conversation. And uh, Honorable Wang, of course you saw your party leader there, and uh, the party, the deputy party leader of uh, Honorable uh, Boss, uh, speaking in some veiled terms, of course, uh, the, your party leader accusing somebody of uh, being a fisi in Ngozi Akondo. Have we started the campaigns for 2022? Honorable Wang. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you, Sam. Um, I think what my party leader was referring to, uh, if, if you, I don't know Kiswahili that much, but Fisi Kwangozi Yakondo, uh, my party leader knows Kiswahili much better than myself. Uh, Fisi Nani Yangozi Yakondo means a hypocrite, somebody pretending. And this is what I, I believe uh, this means, that William Ruto now comes out uh, saying that he is the panacea, he, he is the solution to all of Kenyan's problems. This is a man who all his life, uh, political life, I must say, has been in government. Uh, he was Minister for Home Affairs, Minister for Agriculture, Minister for Higher Education, Deputy, I mean, Assistant Minister in the Office of the President, has been Deputy President for the last eight years. Comes out to now point out that Vijana Hawana Kazi, he Hakuna, Hakuna he, and I am the solution to all those problems, really? comes out eight, eight years after being deputy president to start giving people car washes, besheni, in yakosha, you know, nyuele, nini. What the, we're not saying doing those things is bad. No, it's okay. But if you have been deputy president for eight years and you have been in government for the rest of your political life, surely you must point Kenyans to the structural and sustainable solutions that you have had to solve their problems. It cannot be peanuts like throwing maize to, to, to chicken just so that you slaughter them. You cannot come now and tell us you are a hustler, I'm suffering here with you. How are you suffering with them? You yourself are accused and have been charged in court of grabbing somebody's land, an old man. You yourself have been accused of even taking government land and building a hotel on it. And you come and tell us now that you are a, you are a, you are a hustler, I don't know, you, you, you fit with us. It is, a, it is big hypocrisy, and I think that is what my party leader was calling out there. And all Kenyans must call it out. The fact that you do not use your time in government to sort out our problems of unemployment. You did not use your time in government. I mean, if you speak of Raila Odinga's uh, history, you will know that he fought hard. Even this devolution that we are talking about, he mm -hmm. was on the forefront fighting for it, not giving some small handouts. But when he had an opportunity, he, he brought a solution that will long outlast him. Mm -hmm. I'm sure mm -hmm. a, a motorbike for, for a motorbike will not outlast this year alone. You must bring solutions, especially when you're in a position to. You cannot come and pretend. You cannot have your cake and eat it. You cannot okay. be uh, saying, criticizing Wanga. the very Honorable government Wanga. in which you are in. Honorable Wanga, and, 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 and this is the, the thing that we must call out. I, I like how you don't struggle to figure out who your party leader is referring to. But um, Honorable Boz, so 693 days to the election, and uh, the no, deputy I, president I appears... To that out. I, I know it. <laughs> okay. Honorable Boz, your, party, your deputy party leader appears to have already set off for the campaigns. He says that uh, some people want to try to block him from the 2022 race. Don't you think it's a bit of injustice to the public and the voters that uh, really elected this government into office to have started the campaigns a whole one year, 11 months to the next election? Uh, 
First of all, Sam, the official campaign period has not begun, and those are not full-fledged campaigns. I don't see any posters or advertisements out there. That is what election campaigns entail. Meeting people, I do that all the time. If you look at the social media, you might have seen me giving out motorbikes, seen Gladys Wanga doing the same thing in her constituency, uh, giving out sanitizers, giving out water tanks. Th those are the activities we do throughout for the people of Kenya. But we haven't so, heard you, Hona Bobos, we haven't heard you say of the seat that you are looking forward to in 2022. Hold on. There, no, you haven't come to us in issue. We have conversations about it all the time. At every function, people say so-and-so is the next governor, so-and-so is the next uh, senator, and so on. Those are conversations that go on all the time, but they're not full-fledged campaigns when you have registered your candidacy. And, I, and we can continue working with the people. I have recently given out water tanks, sanitizers, motorbikes, uh, checks to women. That doesn't mean that it is a campaign. But I want to go to the actual clip where uh, uh, they said, the deputy president says people are talking about extension of term or another layer of government and that the president wants to extend the term while he's here, WAPI. Mm -hmm. Mine is a very easy issue. I don't have to secure from anybody. Mm -hmm. The Constitution is clear. The president's term is five, five, a five-year term twice. That's it. It's ending in 2022. So the Constitution, Nimesikia Kutoka Constitution, that he cannot extend his term. Nimesikia Kutoka Constitution, that there cannot be another layer of government until the people of Kenya say so. And mm -hmm. also... I can say Nilisikia from Uhuru Kenyatta when he was speaking at Siokimau when he was launching the SGR. He said, Nimechoka. Let me finish my term. I think I had that and there was a clip for that. So I, I think the, 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 what um, calling somebody Fisi, uh, referring to them as a Fisi, or that you are calling the Kenyan people your chickens, being given maize and prepared for slaughter, I think is uh, abusive. It's abusive mm -hmm. and it is derogatory way of referring to the people of Kenya. Right. For someone who complains about people using abusive language, I expect them, uh, to, and or someone who's presidential, I expect them to use uh, better uh, language. But, but I always do, say, do you agree? I may not. You, you call them not campaigns, just meeting the people. But do you agree with, in, with the manner they are being conducted? The meeting in Kisi and so many others that you have seen of the deputy president accom accompanied by several leaders, of course, not wearing masks and standing very close to each other, and the crowds coming to, uh, to cheer them up. I mean, do you agree with that way of doing things during this season? You know, all these meetings are licensed under the approval of the county commissioner. I think that is the job of the county commissioner. It's the job of the county response team. It's them to have those conversations about how to deal with it. And it is all of them. And I think uh, they should be asking themselves, how do they deal with this crowd? Because they've uh, had challenges. And by the way, Sam Ketiku, um, you need to realize that even when the president went uh, along Thika Road, or was it near Githurai area and so on, I mean, it was similar. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there is also an issue of crowd control. We've seen our funerals at, ho at home. And those are the conversations that we should be having is yes, we still have to continue with our normal lives, but then how do we do it uh, with safety? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just uh, the COVID response team reminding people of the protocols and encouraging them uh, to put in uh, the protocols. And, and, uh, and I think people will be able to listen. And I don't believe mm -hmm. that you should arrest people or prohibit people from meeting. I think it has to be a conversation of encouraging people. And, and so that when the county commissioner is saying you're having the meetings, they should try and, you know, go around with their loudspeakers, telling people so, try so, and wear masks and so on. So I don't believe in policing people into it. Okay. I believe in persuading. When I see my minister standing up there giving us COVID statistics, you know, you should also use the time not just to give statistics because they don't mean much to many people. They also encourage people about the mask. Even tell you we should be seeing a, a drive by the, the government itself to try and put uh, 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 washing, hand washing mm -hmm. machines at various vantage points. Uh, the, the, there's the, a question, Hona Bobos, that you have not responded to. And that is, uh, what would drive the deputy president to, you're saying it's not the official campaign, but he has already spoken about going to the state house and saying that the hustlers are the ones that reform the next government. Of course, he's referring to himself. Is there any perfect excuse why an elected deputy president would be starting the campaigns at such a time? 
There's nothing wrong with that at all. I mean, in Kenya, we look at the future. It's already, if you remember, uh, in the U.S., there is a sitting president, even long before their campaign period began, as far as last year, Joe Biden was mentioning about his candidacy. Elizabeth Warren was mentioning about her candidacy. So that is normal. It okay. happens in every country. Yes, okay. so I, I think it's unfair to say, uh, in fact, by the second term mm. of any presidency, believe me, people already stop thinking about the existing president and start looking at the future. That is the reality of any country that has a highly uh, de democratic space for people to express themselves. Okay. But yes, we have the executive. The executive continues. Yeah, the minister, they continue to perform their duties. There's already an agenda set. There's the big four and so on, and that is uh, what's going on. But right. what you meeting people, it's like I'm a legislator, but I always go out to meet people. So anyone can say that Gladys is effectively on campaigns down in Wasingishu County. Okay, all right. Thank you so much, Gladys Boss. I wish we had uh, Senator Sylvia Kasanga to give us the final word on what she feels because uh, yourself and Gladys Wanga are elected officials. For her, she's nominated, so, uh, so she might um, have uh, a different view, but all the same. Thank you so much for your time, a woman representative for Wasingishu. We had Gladys Wanga, the woman representative for Homer Bay County, as well as uh, Senator Sylvia Kasanga, nominated senator of the Waipa Party. Thank you for your time to have that conversation. And now as we wind up on the daybreak, uh, this segment, I want us to take a look at uh, the situation in the country to do with the COVID-19 by looking at some of the slides that we have to give us a picture of what we are dealing with when it comes to the pandemic. Do we have those slides that we can uh, take a look at the numbers? Because so far, the total infections are 36,205 in the country out of uh, 498,000 uh, tests that have so far been run. Um, the total recoveries have been 23,243, that is 64%. The death toll is at 624, 624, that's 1.7%. The active cases, therefore, at uh, 34%. Let's take a look at uh, 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 the next slide that uh, gives us a review of uh, the week that ended on Sunday, uh, Sunday the 13th of September. Uh, it would appear that we were at 36,157, that meaning that we had in, uh, the number of uh, COVID-19 cases had risen by 1,054. That's a daily average of 151. The new deaths recorded in the seven days to 13th of September were 2025, 20, and the recoveries were 2013. Uh, that's a, an increment from the previous week. Um, then for the samples that were tested during that week, it was at 23,175, and the positivity rate for that week was 4.5%. Of course, uh, we know that uh, the numbers of uh, samples tested has been declining. Also, we know that in as far as the pandemic uh, tracking is concerned, the weekly tra tracking, we have now been consistently on the decline. If you look at the curve, it would appear to have peaked at uh, 4,450, that is on week 21, uh, but now has been declining to 10, 1,046, uh, but rose a little bit. If you look at the week 26, it rose a little bit to 1,054. That's a difference of about eight new infections between the two weeks. Um, something else that to look at is on the, I believe, the Kenya's worst month. If you had to look at um, the number of uh, uh, cases reported every week, um, our average now in September is at 143 every day. So that is actually lower than our daily average that was in June when uh, we're on the ascens uh, as as ascending uh, path because in June we had a daily average of 147 infections, a total of 4,404. So far you have 2,004. Uh, by mid-September, and the daily average, like I said, is at 143. The other slides that we look at is in as far as the, what do you call it, the positivity rate of uh, the month of September. It's been uh, flip-flopping, but uh, a bit consistent over the past few days. So you'll see that on the 1st of t September, the positivity rate was at 6.7. Uh, that went to 5.3% uh, on, on the 3rd. And now the past few days, we have been at 3.6% on the 9th of September, then went to 3.7, 4.1, 4.2, 6.0 on Sunday, and now yesterday at 4.4. So you, um, we are told by the authorities that we need to be below 5% to be in a position to know that we are flattening the curve. And then you can see uh, the gender burden, 64.5% being male. And to, to speak to us this morning is uh, Dr. I mean, I mean uh, sorry, um, 
uh, to speak to, the, okay, those are the numbers in the counties, the spread with Nairobi leading with 20,005 uh, infections. As we look at that, uh, speaking to us is the Chief Executive Office of the Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentist, Dentist Council, that is uh, Daniel Yumbia. Uh, good morning, sir. And now we know that uh, the Minister of Education is holding a meeting to establish how soon we can resume schooling. We're looking at the numbers. The positivity rate has been declining. The number of new infections have been declining. Are we safe to say that we can now start to reopen those sensitive um, parts of our society uh, based on the data that we have? Uh, good morning, Sam. Uh, admittedly, uh, the uh, numbers are declining. And that's a very good thing to say and to report that uh, over the last one week, we've noted the numbers are uh, steadily declining. We, we seem to be almost, and I use the word almost, flattening the curve. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> we, we are committed to ensure that uh, we bring the numbers down <clears throat> to a level that uh, we can advise the, the, the national government to consider uh, reopening uh, the country. Mm -hmm. However, uh, also we are noticing uh, warring trade where politicians... <clears throat> in particular are organizing large gatherings mm -hmm. where people are going for meetings without <clears throat> wearing masks. Right. So that could be a threat to the gains that we have so far uh, achieved. We just want to appeal uh, to people that uh, it is important that they ensure that they continue practicing the social distance and the wearing of masks and sanitizing and washing hands so that we can reach uh, the place where we are anticipating. Right. With, with that in mind, <clears throat> the education sector is now the major focus. <clears throat> and I must say, as council, mm -hmm. we, we, we noted that uh, the, the, the decline indicated that uh, we are moving towards opening uh, schools. However, that will depend on various others, other factors. Hmm. But for us, we have directed uh, medical schools, uh, final year students, whom we believe are qualified doctors, almost there. We need to finalize their exams and go for internship to the hospitals. Uh, we okay. directed that two weeks ago they resume their classes. And this is because normally they are, they are their final year classes are undertaken in hospital setups. Okay, and so, uh, Mr. Discussions, discussions no, no, are just, a, just a minute, uh, Mr. Yumbia. Um, <coughs> yes. so, so the question I'm asking is, uh, of course, when you look at the data, uh, the number of tests that are being uh, run is also declining, and people have been asking the question whether the data we, ha we have is reliable. Of course, the WHO has also raised uh, such kind of concerns, and that is why I still ask, are we confident that the data we're getting uh, from this situation is uh, sufficient to guide decision-making at this point? Well, that is yes and no, because uh, uh, historically we have been doing targeted testing. We've not been doing um, uh, mass testing for some time now. We, we get uh, conduct tracing, and uh, once somebody has tested positive, we go to the family and test the family or the close conduct to ensure that we, we contain uh, the numbers that are, uh, uh, are uh, infected. And therefore, we, the, the lower the number of the uh, people who test uh, positive, also the lower the number of con the conducts that are mm -hmm. being traced. Therefore, you may say that um, we, we, we're not testing uh, masses, but we are testing uh, contacts that have uh, been identified. And therefore, it may be justified to say the numbers are going down. Okay, as we wind up on this, so now as the schools, of course we know there's a meeting this morning of the COVID-19 committee uh, in charge of education. Uh, so what do you think would be the protocols that we must observe as learners resume classes? You say that the medical schools is the final year students. Should the same apply for primary school and uh, secondary school that the final year students go back or the, the entire No, no, class? no, no. The, the, the principal protocols that need to apply for, for actually medical schools, I would say... Uh, those people are taking medical-related courses, mm -hmm. nurses, clinical officers, laboratory technologies, should be given priority. Those, those are healthcare workers, mm -hmm. who some of them are at um, their final year st stages, and others are in the middle of their training, and those ones should be given uh, 
uh, first priority so that they can go back to school so that we can increase the number of health workers. For secondary schools, I would say yes, we may have to consider the candidates. And for primary schools, mm -hmm. we may also have to consider candidates. But for the lower classes, we may have to wait a bit longer. But uh, the uh, hand washing, sanitize, uh, sanitizing, and social distance should be prioritized in all schools. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Daniel Yumbia, the Chief Executive Officer, the Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentist Council, thank you for your time for speaking to us here on Debrek. And uh, that's our time on this segment. We take a short break, but when you return, one Willis Raburu will be engaging Professor as uh, he brings you the uh, comic Tuesday after the break. <laughs>